Okay, The Colours That Blind, Chapter 7. Amboya dances the way she always does when a car belonging to one of her children or grandchildren pulls onto the homestead. Her grey dreadlocks sway back and forth. Makoma drives slowly towards the shade of the mango tree, a big grin on his face, while Amboya trails by the side of the car next to his window, singing and dancing. I try and imagine her the way the diary entries describe, big afro, flowing dress, younger. Nah, no way she was ever younger than this. A big farmhouse stands on one side of the yard with two huts right beside it, and almost like having three houses there. Amboya uses one of the huts as a silo for maize after the harvest season, and the other as a kitchen because it was built to accommodate cooking fires. So when she needs to cook delicacies that would use up too much electricity, she uses that kitchen instead of the stove in the main house. Today seems to be one of those days, but Amboya enjoys food cooked on the fire anyway, so any excuse to use the flames is a good one for her. Listen, for this I'm not complaining. I can smell the mouth-watering smell of matumbu, a fine dish of cow's intestines that she serves with salsa and spicy vegetables. I lick my lips, well aware that I'm going to be doing some tongue-chewing tonight from all that goodness. E chinik godu, Naku shouts, hands on her head, mimicking all those Nollywood actresses she's been watching lately on TV. How could you have wanted to miss this too? Her big wide eyes dart about wildly, taking in all the animals roaming around Amboya's small yard, sending a clear message that they own the place. The kindergarten teacher recently asked Saru if Noku's father is Nigerian because of all the dramatic expressions that Noku comes out with using her best Nigerian accent. But Nollywood movies are Saru's Achilles heel, so all these expressions that Noku uses are not going anywhere anytime soon. These are the things that I enjoy being uh, about being at Amboa's, like how the moon always seems to come out early and stare down the last rays of the sun, and how clearly you can see the stars twinkling without competing with all those city lights, almost as though they were greeting you. But I'm still not safe here, and I have to show Makomo before it's too late. As soon as the car stops, Amboya pulls open Makomo's door and engulfs him in a long embrace, singing his totem in the process. She turns to me, but I quickly look away. I remember the scars, but this time they look even darker, befitting of someone who watches people die. Once, when I asked Bamkuru where Amboya got her scars, he took off his belt and gave me five good ones on the soles of my feet for being disrespectful. Though it still made no sense to me, he said that it was not our culture for children to ask such questions. Bamkuru is like that. He has all these things he believes because of culture. And I think some of them are a bit messed up. All I got out of Makomo was that Amboya had gotten the scars on her face from doing something brave. But I knew that it was kind of a lie that you tell children to calm their fears. My eyes accidentally traced the scars once more before I dragged them away. Makomo says it's rude to stare, so I'm trying not to. I hold tight to my seatbelt, which is still firmly done up. Muskuru Wanga! My eyes are glued to Amboya as she dances away towards my door. I hear the screams that tore out of me when I was taken from my warm bed and shoved in that white van in the pitch of night, with Bamkuru's voice somewhere in the background. The doors open, my palms moisten. Ah, you look as if you've seen a ghost to Marai. Give your Amboya a hug. My body tenses as she unbuckles my seatbelt. Amboya, what about me? Noku says, stomping on my feet to jump into the old woman's arms. I breathe in relief. Amboya, Daddy tried to starve us. My stomach was grumbling so much I thought they were a cow in my belly. She pouts, eyeing Makoma, and sending them both into fits of laughter. Don't worry, my Muskuru. Your Amboya has prepared some delicious food for you. Amboya's eyes shift to me, smiling heartily, with Noku balanced effortlessly on her hip, despite how heavy she is. Laughter floats in the compound. A young boy leads the goats and cattle into the kraals at the edge of the compound, close to the big bowing tree that seems to have more branches and leaves than it can hold. I remember play playing under there, enjoying the shade and whispers of the tree. Bamkoru had once told us that the bowing tree slumped like that because it held so many people's secrets and they were too heavy for it. 
He said that if you went under it, you could hear it whispering the secrets through the wind, trying to give some of them away. Mumkoma unloads the groceries from the boot, while two other boys who have emerged from nowhere pick them up and take them to the main house. Tumire, get out the car so I can see how much you've grown. I'd almost forgotten that I'm still in the car. A strange feeling bubbles inside me as I get ready to be stared at. Amboya reaches for my hand and my heart explodes, causing my lungs to go stiff. Mkoma gives me a sharp eye. I slowed out of the seat and force a smile. How are you, Amboya? Ah, oh, look at you, almost a full-grown man now, Ms. Karu, with that thick voice breaking nicely like that. She nudges me as though we are friends. Although I don't want to, I can't help but smile. You'll soon be a very strong man with all those pretty girls hoping you'll chase after them. Her to Marie, she says, winking at me. I look down, slightly embarrassed. Now, everyone, let's go inside. You must all be hungry. I looked at Noku, waiting for her to talk about our little shop at the halfway house, our little stop at the halfway house. But there was a whole three and a half hours ago, and by the silence I figure she must be hungry again. We eat, and then sit around the fire in the round hut, licking our fingers. The flickers of the flame illuminate the kitchen and dance across people's faces. The room is full. There's a boy, Ranga, one of the people who helped carry the groceries earlier. He's almost my age, and I heard Mankoma say that Amboya has become mother to him because his parents both died. There is also a much older cousin who has been having trouble finding a job in the city, but will be getting a ride to town with Mankoma when he leaves. An aunt and her daughter who came from next door to greet Amboya's grandchildren and an old man who doesn't say much but who catches my eye because of a huge tattoo of a knife on his bicep. Amboya's home almost seems like a centre for wanderers. Your Amboya tells me you're doing a great job flying big aeroplanes around the world, the old man says to Makoma, his voice soft. Makoma smiles and starts telling his best stories from work. The room goes quiet as we all drink in his voice and swallow his hilarious tales. His mood right now is a whole vibe. Makoma has that thing about him when he starts talking, when he doesn't have thinking lines following his forehead, eyes, eye where everyone it draws in and listens attentively. Sometimes, even if he's only blubbering on about whatever, like that he's hungry, people still want to hear. I smile. I should own up to it. I'm very proud to be his younger brother. I like this side of him. Tonight, he isn't the strict Makoma or the worried one either. He seems more carefree. Perhaps having Amboya there makes him feel like a child. Or maybe it's the way an evening fire lifts the veil of storytelling, giving the tellers confidence and allowing the rest of us into new worlds.